Have you ever wondered how to take your cannabis oil and really enrich it? To actually move the cannabinoids from something like 60% all the way to 90% concentration? Well, to do that, you're going to need to use something like short path distillation or SPD. Today's guest, Alice Day Walton, is going to be on to explain the technology. And if you want to know the ever elusive question of whether you can split THC from CBD, you're going to have to stay till the end. Enjoy this conversation. I really had a lot of fun with it. Hi, Al. Great to have you on today. Um, today, we're going to tackle quite a niche topic in extraction, which is short path distillation, uh, or SPD as it's commonly known. Um, and I'm going to share an image later on to show everyone what SPD is, but I'll pop an image on quickly for the video as well. So in this space, Al, you've been quite active in terms of taking not just you know crude oil and those extractions, but now refining it, you know, essentially increasing the purity of those cannabinoids from maybe, let's say, you've got a 60% crude to a 90% oil. Um, can you take us through, essentially, for starters, you know, what is SPD, SPD and, you know, what is some of the initial, you know, preparation that goes to that crude? Yeah, totally, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So the, the thing with a short path distillation system under a high vacuum, you can start separating them very closely together. So you can take, as you say, a crude oil that tests, let's say, 60% for potency of whatever particular cannabinoid, and you can improve the purity simply by boiling off each fraction, as we call it, that you want, and collecting that fraction, which then gives you a purer mixture. And those fractions are usually separated by the boiling points. And then in an SPD, what we do is we use a deep vacuum and different boiling points to start separating the oil into its various fractions. And in that way, we can achieve much higher purity in concentration of products, especially if they can be separated by their boiling point. Yeah, awesome. Great definition. I mean, uh, often I've seen people just get it wrong in terms of they buy an SPD unit, they try to use it. You know, what is some of the stuff in terms of like uh, preparation that you do uh, before you go to an SPD, like de-waxing, de Take us through that a bit. So the, the thing with a short path distillation system or, you know, any kind of purification system is when you start with a very uh, complex mixture, there, there can be a lot of things that overlap that may co-distill or may boil off when you don't want them to boil off. And so before we even get to the SPD system, a lot of uh, pre-processing, as you say, goes into it. And what that involves is one very uh, common aspect is winterizing, as you say, or de-waxing. A way in which we precip precipitate the fats out of our oil. Um, and because these fats aren't um, of interest or they're not necessarily active in terms of what kind of you know compound we're looking for, we can remove them, filter them off, and then not have them in that mixture when we start boiling it. Similarly, you know, people may take measures to remove sugars, they may take measures to remove acids, they may take measures to remove um, even certain pigments that you don't want part of that boiling mixture. So when we have such a complex boiling mixture, there can be a lot of entrapment or a lot of co-distillation going on, and your fraction then comes out a whole lot dirtier or less pure per se, and then you'll have to redo that. And every time we start heating cannabinoids and every time, you know, we start playing around with these molecules, we can affect them, we can degrade them, we can change them, we can, you know, essentially change from what the original molecule was into something else. And the idea is to try and minimize that as much as possible. And the best way to do that is to remove as many unwanted components before we get to that point. And those unwanted components can be removed in a variety of ways. And a lot of those ways are always going to be dictated by what kind of extraction was done. Different extraction will always pull out different combinations or different mixtures of molecules um, or compounds. And so, you know, depending on what kind of extraction we do, it might determine what kind of post-processing we do before we start trying to separate it by a boiling point. Yeah, fully. And I mean, this is the point as well. I mean, you need to remember a lot of this uh, for the users out there is under extreme vacuums. Uh, the better the vacuum, the better the uh, separation and the lower you go because there's all these isomeric reactions that can start to happen as temperatures elevate in the boiling flask. And you want to make sure that you just dampen that as, poss as low as possible. So you can kind of and that whole idea of getting as much out ahead of time that you don't need events exactly what Al said here about co-distilling out products. I'm going to actually share my screen here quickly. So Al, yeah. um, perfect. Uh, 
here we have on the screen uh, a short path distillation. So can you explain to us, you know, short path and I'll point along as you go from the heating mantle. You know, basically we've got our crude that goes into this heating mantle and you can have a, a two liter, a one liter, a 20 liter. I don't think many guys go bigger than a 20 liter on SPD. You might move to walling, for a whip form or rolling form distillation for that. Uh, but talk us through the process uh, from the initial heating mantle. Yeah, so here we're looking at an across international uh, short path distillation kit. Um, I do think they're available locally through Amadab, I believe. Um, very good quality products, American American brand. And what we will start by doing is firstly, obviously, extracting our oil, um, cleaning up our oil as much as we want, and then we would load it into the boiling flask, which is what you're pointing at now. Once it's in that boiling flask, we will then try and pull a vacuum on it until we get to the deepest possible vacuum we can get to. While there's no heat, there's nothing happening. All you have is oil sitting in that boiling flask. You generate a vacuum, which you can see is by the Welsh pump down there on the right. Um, and then you monitor that. You can see by the vacuum um, gauge, which is then also the gauge is then between the, the collection flask and the, and the cold trap. So, what we'll do then is we'll pull out the vacuum as deep as it goes. And once we're at our ultimate vacuum or at the vacuum we're happy with, we will start heating the mixture. And as we heat the mixture, certain molecules will start boiling off that mixture and they'll travel up, as you're pointing out there, what we call a condenser. And that condenser then will be cooled or heated, depending on how you want to go, but I think we'll get to that at a later stage. Um, and those, that mixture will then drop down into the boiling, into the collection flask. When we are done collecting a particular fraction, or when we believe that we've collected all we can collect at that boiling point, we will then move up in temperature. And we'll keep doing this until we're happy that we've removed all of a particular fraction or a particular uh, group of compounds that will boil at a certain temperature. If we want to keep those, Compounds, we then remove the boiling flask, I mean the collection flask, and we'll replace it with another collection flask to collect the next group of compounds that boil off in the next yeah. you know, set and of I'll temperatures. I'll quickly jump in, yeah. So there's different options as well. Sometimes you get an example where it almost looks like cast heat and it's got like multiple of these collection flasks. And the idea there is to just twist it as the next uh, frac fraction comes in. Uh, and the idea is not mm -hmm. to break vacuum every time, you know, because if you have to remove it, you've got to break the vacuum. But, you know, Correct. there's different methods. You know, some guys prefer something a little like this. Other guys prefer to roll around. And then explain maybe also the need for, like, what's the cold trap that's at the back here? Often what's the purpose there? So the, the biggest thing is, is protection for your vacuum pump. Yep. Um, the vacuum pumps can be sensitive pieces of equipment. Um, and what we're working with here tend to be very high volatile um, compounds that especially things like terpenes may only condense at exceptionally low temperatures. So what we do with that cold trap is we'll fill it either with an immersion chiller or with dry ice and a solvent to try and get the coldest temperature we can. And that effectively protects the pump from uh, pulling any vapors that are still ha that still have enough energy to move through the system. Those vapors then condense in that cold trap and collect at the bottom there. Awesome. And, and for those who don't know, this is an example of a chiller. Precision chillers are obviously your typically your louders, your Hoovers and your poly science type of chillers. And then you've got Edwards pumps as well. You know, there's generally a range of some good pumps out there. And on that question, I'm going to stop sharing because uh, I always like it back in the full screen. You know, when it comes to specifically now, we're talking about the vacuum strength. Uh, I've seen this often debated, you know, what's the best vacuum strength? How low do you go? Explain some of the rationale between going lower and lower in terms of the vacuum I think the 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 most important thing to understand is that vacuum is always going to determine how close your boiling points are going to be. If you have an exceptionally low vacuum, you can boil one compound at almost a degree apart from another compound. And provided your vacuum can maintain that that uh, closeness and boiling point, you will be able to have a much tighter separation. So, Again, it, you know, it does get a bit more complicated. Maybe at some stages you want to use a higher vacuum, other stages you want to use a lower vacuum. But the rule of thumb is the deeper the vacuum you can get, the better it is, is not only because of how you can separate your molecules by temperature, but also because you get less degradation. 
Okay, um, awesome. And we know cannabinoids will be affected by heat. So the less heat we can use, the better always. Excellent. And so deep vacuum is always the best. And not only deep vacuum, good vacuum control. Being able to switch between a high and a lower vacuum, depending on what fraction you are, can also help refine your process. No, 100%. And on this point, I mean, let me ask the question that comes up next is like, we've seen like certain extraction uh, professionals really, and this is more the North American market that specializes here. Uh, you know, that difference, like usually people use a cold condensing uh, on the actual, you know, as it comes up the vapor tube and it starts to go down towards the collection flask, there'll be cold condensed and there'll be also this technique around hot condensing. Can you give us a bit of a breakdown of those comparisons in between the two? For sure, for sure. So, um, you know, in, in typical cold condensing, what we do is we boil our, our, our crude mixture and then as it rises up the head and goes into the condenser, it starts to cool and then we can collect it. And so basically anything that that can be cooled at those temperatures will be cooled and will drop out of the gaseous phase. So it does A, offer certain protection to our, our cold trap. Um, but B, you know, if, if that's what we want to collect, we can collect it via cold condensing. Um, what that does, however, do is it limits you to a certain extent because, you know, everyone knows time is money. And these are processes that can take, you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. And if you're cold condensing, you could sit at a particular fraction for five, six, seven hours before it's actually finished coming off because it just, you know, it comes off so slowly. And so when using a cold condenser, your fraction doesn't finish. If you, sorry, not to jump back a bit, but if you take as a real life example, if you're going for what we call the heads fraction or the fraction that comes off usually before your main body fraction, if you, if you heat too fast through that head's fraction, it will then come co-distill with your main body fraction. And that co-distilling then ruins the purity. So you could sit for hours and hours and hours at that head fraction, just waiting for it to slowly condense and drip off. On the converse side, if you heat your condenser, you can move things a lot quicker through your system because the molecules when they reach your condenser are still energized enough they're still hot enough to stay in their vapor form and not drop down into your con into your collection flask and shoot straight through across into your cold trap and because your cold trap is a whole lot colder it will immediately catch out all those highly volatile molecules so the idea is basically just being able to go through your fractions a lot faster and with such a, a small temperature difference between your condenser and your, your boiling flask, you know, in cold condensing, your condenser might be 20 or 30 degrees and your boiling flask is maybe 150, 160, 170 degrees. That, you know, it's over 100 degrees difference. Yeah. In hot condensing, the smaller that difference you can get, the more predictable your molecules become and the more they can flow free, freely through. If it doesn't go on to condense, at 140 degrees or 120 or whatever it won't and it'll shoot straight through to your to your cold trap and this is really important in short path because like i was mentioning heads fractions can take a long time to get through you know there's a lot of entrapment in that oil and so you have a lot of volatiles a lot of smells and flavors and stuff that you actually want to get out of out of your main body you don't want them in your main body but to do it at any kind of appreciable rate that saves you time, they almost always end up coming through into your main body. So by hot distilling, we ensure that when they reach that condenser, they don't condense there. They flow straight through to the system and condense in, in, in the cold trap. Um, and you'll see that in, in white film. That's basically what a white film has as well. You've got an outer body, which is sort of 160, 180 degrees, and the inner body, which is only like 140 or 150 degrees. And so it's effectively hot, con it's effectively working as a molecular distillation. It's a very broad sort of plaster term, but the idea is, is you using the molecules energy to your advantage. And we know that our cannabinoids are going to drop out of that, out of that um, vapor phase awesome. at certain temperatures. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great explanation. I mean, and this, I think tackles this idea because I mean, you hear things like the heads, the body, the tails, you know, these are, and it's about exactly what you said, which is being able to kind of like put them into those different classifications without too much co-distillation between, you know, what yeah. should be in the body ideally doesn't pull into the heads or doesn't pull as much into the tails. And this kind of maybe brings us before we discuss something like a UV spec that can be used, you know, let's just talk about that first pass and that 
second and potentially a third pass. I mean, it's a bit, usually you wouldn't go to a third pass, but like talk us through, you know, that, I think that's exactly it. It's about that enrichment, you know, taking the oil from, you know, your 60% to 90 plus percent. Can you give us some examples of like maybe when you use a second pass compared to maybe just that initial first sure. pass that you kind of described? So, so usually what's happening in a short path in a short path system is the first thing you want to do is take your crude oil and separate it, separate your crude from what you expect to be your main cannabinoid fraction as quickly as possible. Extreme heat, because we don't know what's in that mixture, there can be a variety of different compounds that will then affect the, your molecules that you're after as well. So you don't want to expose it to too much heat or too much oxygenation for too long. And you basically just want to rip off the gunk from the good effectively you want a very basic separation between things that won't distill under 200 degrees and things that do distill under 200 degrees just for argument's sake um, that's what we call the first pass and the idea in your first pass is just to get a, a, a very raw separation as quickly as possible so there is so we're working with a much more refined product and we're also working with a lot less product you know in a, in a short path distillation you, you can start with two liters of product and you know, to get through all those two liters is going to take you quite a long time. Whereas if you can just start with one liter of product, it'll may maybe go a bit quicker. So that would be your first pass, just to basically separate them as, as quickly as possible. From there, there can be a variety of different pre -pro I mean, post-processing methods and that to sort of further clear it up. But the idea would be once you've got your first pass material, you can then put it back into your, into your SPD kit and rerun it for what we call a second pass and the main benefit of this is in a first pass it can be very difficult to maintain very low vacuums because there are so many other things in there unless you've got days and days and days to go through each fraction which can be you know however many degrees wide um, we can now focus on getting a much lower vacuum because they're less volatiles in our second fraction. Um, there are a lot, you know, basically a lot less um, amounts of mo molecules that can come off. So we can focus really on getting a much tighter separation. And that would be the idea is in our second pass, we're really trying to focus on getting a very close split on what we do. So we might spend more time at a certain temperature than before. Whereas in first pass, we might just ramp it all the way through and just try and get as, as brute a kind of um, separation as possible. As for third pass, people do do it. It is possible. Um, our biggest concern, like we mentioned before, is heat, especially heat, can cause degradation of cannabinoids. Mm -hmm. And so the more times you expose your oil to these high temperatures, the more chances there are of uh, degradation. Yeah. And so... We, you know, we, we ideally, if we could do it in one pass, that would be perfect. If we could just distill off perfectly clear cannabinoid fractions in one pass, that would be ideal. But the mixture is just too, you know, it's too complex a mixture that, you know, it's very difficult to do. So you can do a third pass, but you can expect to see a lot of isomerization from that then, um, and maybe even degradation products. Uh, it is up for debate. You'd have to do the tests. Some people might get away with having none of it, you know, in very small, in very, very um, small samples, you might not get that much going on. Um, a lot of it's also got to do with what else is present in your mixture. So this is, you know, going back to that first pass idea, certain methods of extraction might bring certain undesirable molecules into your mixture and adding those molecules plus heat can then start changing what you're getting out. So a good example of that would be CO2 extraction is very, commonly known for causing high isomerization when distilling because of what it extracts, then adding the heat to it. If you haven't pre-processed properly, will cause that isomerization. So yeah, it, it is possible, but the idea would be is to get as brute a separation in the beginning and then work with a much more refined mixture to then try and distill out of. Yeah, awesome. I mean, that, that, that's fair. I mean, it's, it's one way ever you're doing extraction, you need to think about everything is interconnected. You know, your, your initial extraction, yeah. what you used there, how you cleaned up, uh, you yeah. know, if you winterized or you didn't, if you decarbed or you didn't, if you 100%. applied SPD, I mean, all of this, because often we see people even with like, and we'll talk maybe on chromatography to close out, but like, you know, the, the idea that, you know, just taking crude oil and sticking it on a column is, is suicide. You know, you're going to destroy the column. You're going to have um, essentially a lot of issues okay. that pop up uh, with the column, okay. you know, feeling the, 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 you know, it gets blocked. And you want to be able to use a column as repeatedly and yeah. as often as you before you have to replace that sorbent. 
at some point because exactly. at some point you will um exactly. so in this regard i mean uh I got an, a question I want to ask you, obviously about you know the separation of CBD and THC. But before we get to that, I mean we do sometimes see the use of like a UV attachment, like a fraction finder or something, you know, onto the vapor tube. Does it really help? You know, are they really picking up? You know, sometimes a nice instead of a visual or a time-based SOP, you know, at a certain temperature and vacuum for this long, you know, that kind of defines the fraction. I know sometimes there is some visual cues. But does it really, do you see a lot of operators making use of these supplemental tools or is it just one way experience really counts for a lot? I think no, nothing will take away from the experience. Yeah. Um, you know, just the hands-on, seeing it, knowing it, the feel almost. It's, you know, uh, alcohol distillers will tell you the same. Just knowing kind of when it's right is, is definitely the, the first prize. As for the UV spectrometry, <clears throat> you know, like I'm, I'm not really a skilled enough scientist or a scientist at all, but, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm not clued up enough to be able to definitively talk on this. Um, I have worked very closely with um, providers, um, two of the major pr products in the market at the moment. One is the Fraction Finder. Definitely a bit of a, a disconnect in the, in the industry as to who's right about what. Um, the reality, I think, however, is any tool that can help you get a better separation is always going to be a good tool to use mm -hmm. because you might not have that perf you might not have that experienced guy there all the time, and you just need someone who can look at a visual cue and say, "Okay, now we change flask." Uh, I do know I have used a fraction finder personally, um, and it definitely does have all that complex science behind, and they're giving you a consumer product. So they're saying, yes, maybe the cannabinoids don't necessarily uh, fluoresce themselves, but we've figured out during our R&D process that our program balances out for this and the UV, um, the UV spectrum is in the right way. So whatever it's doing, it's giving you a good cue, no matter what. Um, and the other thing we must remember is, I mean, UV spectrometry is used already in cannabinoid, pro in cannabinoid potency testing. You know, lots of HPLCs will have UV um, um, detectors on them. Yeah. So th th there has to be yeah, detectors, right? There, there has to be validity in using UV to detect cannabinoids. Um, you know, as far back as the 70s when they used UV cameras to find fields. You know, because you can shine UV at a, at a cannabis flower and it will, you know, reflect that UV. Um, so that's why I'm kind of on of the opinion now of sort of don't get too bogged down in the science and rather think about it like a tool. Is it a tool that helps your process? Yes, it's well worth it. Does it not help your process? Then, you know, that's not, it's, it's not going to be worth it. And things like the fraction finder will help your process. Things like the pigment tracker will help your process all the time. Um, because, you know, not everyone has access to a, a quick NAS spec or, you know, a quick NMR or something just to double check what they're getting. Awesome. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I have to say, to the golden question, I mean, uh, I know this has been debated often. Uh, I don't think it's so much of a debate. I think it's, it's relatively clear. But sometimes people think they can use, <coughs> sorry, short paths to separate THC from CBD. I don't think we think that's really very viable. Not very easy to do Not because of where the vapor points are. But what's your view on yeah. that one? You know, how, if you want yeah. to separate CBD and THC, what are the, what are potential options? Your, your your options are basically chromatography. The long and the short of it, the options are chromatography. In theory, you know, under extreme vacuums, maybe in extreme pre-processing conditions, you know, almost in a theoretical sense only, you could do it via, a, you know, a myriad of different different ways, short path being one of them. But the reality is for the world in which we live, chromatography and more specifically flash chromatography is going to be basically your only options. Um, their boiling points are just too close together to be able to separate them in any kind of uh, thermodynamic way. Yeah, fully. I mean, there, there's, a, there's probably a good uh, reason for us to come back and discuss, uh, you know, THC degradation to make a compliant product if we're talking about a CBD product. I mean, there's things thrown around like harmonic distillation, there's degradation reactions under ozone, there's even nucleation where trying to exploit the fact that maybe uh, CBD will crystallize, but, you know, decarboxylated THC won't crystallize, only THCA will, you know, so trying to uh, wash into fractions and nucleates and then kind of make a compliant product that way. 
But uh, that's maybe time for another talk. Uh, Al, I just want to say thank you so much for making time to kind of yeah. unpack this world of SPD. It gets thrown around. People are like, what short path distillation? Is it, is it like a rotor app? No, it's not. Completely different. You know, it's that added step on nuance you need to sometimes apply. And it really allows you just to up it all enrich the cannabinoids. Um, and for anyone who's looking to reach out to Al for some engagement, uh, you know, contract him in for some work. I mean, he's, uh, I'll put his details in the description below. Uh, and I, I know that you also have a consulting firm called uh, Cannabin Nerds. So I'll put in some of those details there to link through. But Al, thank you again so much for your time. Uh, giving uh, everyone a bit of more line of sight. Uh, you, you know, it's always nice to hear from operators who've worked with equipment like SPD because uh, it's a little, it's a little more appreciated when it's uh, from an actual uh, contact that's live and using the equipment. So, Al, thank you so much for coming on. Now, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Alice there focused on cannabinoid extraction and enrichment technology. And this is the type of subject matter I really enjoy putting on the channel. Be sure to go check out the rest of the material out there on general extraction. And I'm hoping to bring you a lot more on extraction technologies as well as the legality of cannabis in South Africa and Africa as a whole.